Hey everybody, take two on this video. I started and then the loudest recycling truck in the world drove by. And I think everybody here uses very loud aluminum <laughs> recycling material <laughs> to stop the video. It's just so loud. Anyway, I'm in California. As uh, many of you know from reading the emails, I hope you all are reading the emails I send out. I try not to send too many, but I'm in California here for a month, which means I'll be here for mostly working from during the day in the morning because it'll leak into the afternoon your time. So that's kind of the plan is to work here, you know, roughly nine to 12 Eastern time and, uh, and then uh, do what we want to do in the afternoon. So beautiful palm tree in our yard right there. Really, uh, am I getting that right? Yeah, they were just right there on my head's in the way of a nice, beautiful palm tree, big one, big fat one. Love those things. Anyway, uh, what I want to talk today about was, was rates and what we have going on here is we have, um, for a while, this hasn't mattered. You know, after the after the excessive inflation numbers in 2020, 2021, the Fed started increasing rates in 2021. And in the last 18 months, they've taken the short-term rate from zero to five to around five and a half percent. And we're all too young to remember this. And you have to be 60 years old or older to remember the 70s with significantly higher interest rates. But I think we get to a point where this is going to start matter mattering because up to this point, the Fed has raised short-term rates to 5.5%, but the yield curve has been inverted. Long-term rates, are the, on the, you know, the 30-year government bond is only at 4.2%. Check this out. Right now, almost 5.5% yield on three-month government bonds. 4.19% on 30-year bonds. That means if you buy, if you commit your money for 30 years and lock it in for 30 years, you get 4%. And if you buy a three-month bond, a lot less lock-in, not a lot less commitment, you get five and almost 5.5%. That's called an inverted yield curve, where the short-term rates are higher than the long-term rates. And part of the reason has been this narrative that, you know, the Fed would have to snuff out inflation, but they'd likely cause a recession by doing that or an economic slowdown. And then they would have to start cutting rates again in the second half of 2023 because eh, just just what's going to happen. You know, we're going to we're going to cause a recession with inc rate increases, et cetera, and we're going to have to uh, rate uh, lower rates. And then as people saw the inflation numbers not going down that fast and they saw that the jobs numbers were looking good and everything was hunky dory, we weren't seeing a recession in a, in a, in a huge sense. They started pushing back those rate cut estimates to the end of 2023. Then they pushed it back to 2024. And now it's nebulous, as the Fed says, again, it's data dependent. So now that the narrative that the Fed was going to cut rates is dissipating, and more and more people, I think, are pulling on the idea that, you know, as we've had not terrible economic data, we've had no, no recession outlook for the next few months, and we've had a lot of that inflationary stuff uh, that happens later on after you get the initial things of inflation where people start demanding wage increases to keep up with inflation, et cetera. You start, your wages are still strong. Unemployment is still pretty low. Consumer confidence is solid. We're, we're not getting this, this, this scenario that would cause the Fed to cut rates. So what happens? If they're not signaling a rate cut because the data is not supporting it, and then even their favorite inflation gauge is still well over 3%. And if they're targeting under 2% inflation, 2% inflation, that means they would have to keep rates higher well past achieving the goal of 2% inflation to make sure it stays there. Like they can't just get to 2.3, get close, and then start cutting rates again. That's not how they're going to do it. They will go right past through that target to make sure they've achieved it and it stays there. So now the market has to adjust to rate expectations. If we're not going to... Keep, if we're not going to have recession, if we're not going to cut short-term rates, then the rate curve needs to normalize where long-term rates need to be higher than short-term rates because that just makes sense from a risk standpoint. You don't lock in a longer-term asset at a, at a lower return, right? It doesn't make any sense. And people thought with, the, with these expected cuts, what they were all expecting, that the rate yield curve would go normal based on the short-term rates going back to two or something. So we'd have the long-term rates would be at four, the short-term rates at two. No, it's not happening. So this is going to have to be accomplished possibly the other way. And if we have longer term rates rising, this could prove hellacious for rate sensitive assets. Might, oh, they're back again. Incredible. 
Not sure why. They like the street. They've been around the street now three or four times. Okay. No, no loud aluminum banging though. That's good. Um, I'm starting to see, you know, so this could prove hellacious for rate sensitive assets. You know, my informal survey, the last year and a half, as they, as they started raising interest rates, I would ask the mortgage brokers that I know, and I would ask the borrowers or new borrowers, new home buyers, et cetera, that I would run into, you know, what are your expectations for rates? And most of them were expecting, if not hopeful, that rates would lower eventually so they could refinance at a better rate. You know, people buying houses now are paying on, you know, somewhere around 7%. And they're not paying anything less for the house than it was two years ago when you could have bought it at 3.5%. I mean, you're avoiding the, the, the super bidding wars, but you're still paying up. And so they're expecting that. And the mortgage brokers I talk to say that when they give people products, they're putting people in products that, for example, they may do a 15-year or a 10 arm, which means a rate is lower, locked in for 10 years, and then it becomes adjustable after that. And the reason they're doing that is so that they can have a lower rate now in expectation that sometime in the next few years they could refinance lower. So it seemed like everybody I talked to was expecting higher and lower interest rates. And the problem is if that doesn't happen, all right, if, if we don't get lower interest rates in this situation, then, you know, we, we're up as a trouble. So the course of rates will show whether this rally we've had in the stock market in the spring and summer it's a bear bounce or not? Because this happened, I've, I mentioned this in another video, 70, 1974, 75, we thought we had inflation beat. And at that point, and see, Powell mentions this in his talks. At that point, the chairman of the Fed at the time, what's his name, was it Arthur Burns? They thought they had inflation whipped. They had it covered in 74, 75. They started lowering interest rates thinking it was all done. And then you had the second half of the 70s. And that's when you had 21% short-term rates and peaking in 1982. So, you know, history doesn't repeat all the time, but it does rhyme. But the emotions do repeat. You know, you have that, that fear, the greed, the cockiness, the I know what's going to happen. So I'm going to say to you, I don't really know what's going to happen. And so we're playing this out as it is. I'm a little surprised by the strength of the, of the, of the stock market the last few months. And just you know, bidding up everything to to party time, even while the S and P earnings expectations for companies has been decreasing all along. And when people say, and when companies say they beat their earnings expectations, many of them are beating lowered expectations from last year. We're not killing it. You know, Google had seven percent revenue growth, and the stock jumps ten percent. Seven percent. I mean, Google was banging out twenty to thirty percent revenue growth regularly, and now seven percent. We're going to jack the stock up. I I just I'm a, call me skeptical, all right? I think there's some good ideas. Many of you know I like India. Many of you know I like water stocks. I've done videos on that, like healthcare and stuff. But I just, just generically, <clears throat> you know, and I, and I like quality businesses, and Google could be that if if if, if ChatGPT doesn't wreck them. And, and, you know, they speak confidently about it, but that is a threat to a huge part of their business, uh, the, the majority of their business, actually. Um, you know, you know, Google makes money on search, paid search, and YouTube, and everything else they do loses money. Their robotics, their their all their all that. That's why they kind of fired all those people, because they're not making any money, and they they, they have to focus. But this could be pretty troublesome. So I just want you all to, to to just pay attention to this stuff. This could be keep an eye on the interest rates. Keep an eye on what's going on. And what we are doing is we use a fund called PFIX, which is a simplify ETF. It's a simple, well-constructed ETF, which hedges interest rates. They basically own uh, swaps on, on large in interest rate contracts. And it's just a nice retail way for regular guys like you and me to do that. There are more involved ways. And I've told some of you this. This is, you know, some of you that have asked me, some of my high net worth clients, and, you know, I told them to back off the risk. You know, this this month, last month, I've mentioned it. You know, it's nice when you're going up every market's going up every day, but you know, uh, it hasn't been you know other than you know, probably covering shorts and 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 euphoria. It's a good time to back off. So what you can do if you've rising rate environment is back off some of the speculative stuff, rotate into some more conservative stuff, buy some. Of, and we've done this already with most of you. Buy some of these short-term bonds, earn five percent for yourself on your cash. You know, if you've got half a million dollars sitting in the bank earning nothing, 
you know, by making that earn 5%, you could do a heck of a lot for your net worth. Um, other ways to hedge more advanced, you could be using currencies, the US dollar strength against other currencies because we have higher interest rates. We could, you could be um, reducing your exposure to commodities and maybe even some metals. You know, we used to have a much bigger exposure to gold and stuff. Right now, it's just a, it's a pretty small position in, in not small, but it's, it's the, the overall position is small. But we use Sprott because they also have exposure to uranium and many other metals. And, and I do think eventually there'll, there'll be a, a commodity surge and they will be a huge beneficiary of that. But, you know, we, we've got that really reduced. You can reduce exposure to commodities. You could also um, short bonds if you want to. That's maybe for more sophisticated people. Those are big contracts. But and you can do simple stuff. But the simplest thing you can do is just be a little bit smarter about your exposure and uh, reduce kind of overall portfolio risk and take advantage of some of these five percent rates on cash and and that could be the simplest way for somebody with a simple portfolio to to do things. So we're kind of doing a little bit of all that. Uh, we're doing you know, we have cash. Uh, I love the earning cash and, and the, the yield keeps going up every quarter. The Fed may not raise anymore, but the yield's been going up every quarter. Since we started doing that, we're at almost five and a half now. Short-term rates. That's the BIL fund we use. Uh, it's called. Uh, it's the um, State Street Spiders uh, short-term bond fund ticker symbol BIL. It just owns short-term treasuries. It's all it owns, so it pays the pretty high current rate. Uh, you don't have to use these fancy websites or anything to earn cash. Also, the advantage for those of you in a, in a state income in a state with income taxes. The, the interest earned on government bonds is is not taxable at the state level. So your savings bonds, your I bonds, and your government issued securities earn state interest state tax free. And uh, in some situations, the bonds can can create a capital gain that is not tax free, but you get you get the interest tax free. Anyway, I wanted to share that just keep you up to date. I'm keeping my eye on all this stuff for you guys, but I want to share that with you. We've got to watch those interest rates. Be careful about. Um, you know, just be ready for anything. There's also politics involved. I'm not going to mention this too much on this video, but if rates were to go higher and cause economic problems, you know, Powell faces the conundrum that past Fed chairs have faced is do you finish the job on inflation or do you do the politically expedient thing and, and, and increase inflation to make everybody happy, make their asset prices go back up and, and stimulate? And so that's principle versus, you know, which way is the wind blowing? And I prefer principle, but we got to see what uh, what they do. So for now, we can hedge a little bit on that. We can also hedge, hedge with some volatility options and things like that. I didn't mention that. That's a very speculative. No, it's a very uh, volatile thing. It should be used carefully. But in the most simplest terms, we'll keep our eye on this. Take advantage of these short-term rates and reduce exposure to speculative stuff like aggressive growth funds and things like that. You know, dial that back a bit. Move some of that money into the five percent cash. And who knows, if those of you who like to buy and hold and like to own long term, this may also provide a, a good buying opportunity because if we have some kind of rate scare, we could have one of those short term nasty fast sell offs that create the buying opportunities that some of you look for. So have some cash available for those situations too. All right, guys, that's it for me uh, from San Anselmo, California, which is where I am, beautiful little town. And I'll be back in touch with you guys soon.